In 2023, a handful of notorious figures from the world of organized crime persist, whether they've served time behind bars, retired from their life of crime, or are still serving sentences. These intriguing mafia bosses have navigated the tumultuous waters of law enforcement, rivalries, and the passage of time. Today, we delve into the lives of these enigmatic individuals, uncovering their secrets, stories, and the influence they still wield, regardless of their past or present circumstances. These are mafia bosses who are still alive in 2023. Daniel Leo Born in 1941 in East Harlem, New York City, Daniel Leo grew up in a neighborhood known for its tough streets and criminal activities. As a young man, Leo found himself drawn to the allure of the streets, seeking power and respect among his peers. It was during this time that he crossed paths with the infamous East Harlem Purple Gang. The East Harlem Purple Gang was a force to be reckoned with and comprised 127 drug dealers who operated in the heart of East Harlem. This violent gang would go on to produce several prominent members of New York's mob families, and Daniel Leo was among them. Leo quickly made a name for himself within the Purple Gang, showcasing his ruthless nature and determination to rise to the top. He became known for his involvement in various criminal activities, including drug trafficking, extortion, and acts of violence. Leo's reputation as a fearless and cunning individual began to spread throughout the criminal underworld. The Purple Gang's influence extended far beyond the streets of East Harlem. Their criminal activities reached into other parts of New York City, making them a force to be reckoned with. Leo's involvement with the gang allowed him to establish connections and build relationships with other prominent figures in the criminal underworld. As the years went by, Leo's reputation continued to grow, and he became a trusted member of the Purple Gang. His loyalty and dedication to the gang's operations earned him the respect of his peers and superiors. But Leo's ambitions didn't stop there. He had his sights set on something bigger. While Leo was making a name for himself within the Purple gang. A shift was happening within the Genovese crime family, the most secretive and well-run mafia family in New York. Vincent Chin Gigante, the boss of the family, was nearing the end of his leadership. Speculation began to swirl about who would succeed him. Many names were thrown around, but one name remained conspicuously absent from the conversation. That name was Daniel Leo. Little did the authorities in the criminal underworld know that Leo was quietly positioning himself for a significant role within the Genovese crime family. By the time Vincent Gigante's leadership came to an end, Daniel Leo had become one of the most valued members of the Genovese crime family. His involvement with the Purple Gang had solidified his reputation as a formidable and cunning individual, and after Gigante's death, Leo would shock the criminal underworld by assuming the role of the Genovese boss. In 2005, Leo became the acting boss of the Genovese family. It wasn't long after that Leo's criminal activities caught up with him, and on May 30, 2007, Leo was arrested on charges of extortion and federal loan sharking. It was revealed that Leo had made high-interest loans to a livery car businessman, totaling $150,000. When the man struggled to make his payments, he was threatened by Genovese enforcer Charles Salzano. Leo's underlings also targeted two brothers running an illegal gambling operation, extorting and threatening them. On October 31, 2007, Daniel Leo pleaded guilty to the extortion charges and agreed to pay back the $75,000 he had made from these illegal activities. The once feared boss of the Genovese crime family was now facing the consequences of his actions. On February 28, 2008, Daniel Leo was sentenced to five years in prison. At 66 years old, Leo faced the harsh reality of life behind bars. Prison would not be kind to him, but if he made it out, it would be interesting to see if he would continue his life of crime. History has proven, though, that the mafiosi are not bothered by old age. His projected release date was October 7, 2011, but on January 10, 2010, he pleaded guilty to racketeering charges and faced up to 40 years in prison. In March 2010, he was sentenced to an additional 18 months in prison and fined $1.3 million. Leo began serving his time at the Low Security Facility at Federal Correctional Complex, Coleman in Florida, but was subsequently released into community corrections in Miami. He was released from federal custody on January 25, 2013, and has been quiet from the news in terms of his criminal activity. However, his position as the head of the Genovese family was taken over by Libor Liborio Belomo. Liborio Belomo. Belomo was born into a world where loyalty and respect meant everything. Growing up in the tight-knit Italian-American community, he was exposed to the allure of organized crime from an early age. As he came of age, Belomo found himself drawn to the power and influence that the Mafia held. In the 1970s, Belomo became a member of the Genovese crime family, one of the five major Mafia families in New York City. He quickly caught the attention of the family's leaders with his intelligence and street smarts. Belomo's rise within the ranks was swift, and he soon found himself a member of the 
the infamous 116th Street crew, led by the notorious Saverio Sammy Black Santora. The 116th Street crew was known for its involvement in various criminal activities, including extortion, loan sharking, and illegal gambling. Under Santora's guidance, Bellomo honed his skills and earned a reputation as a capable and ruthless mobster. It was during this time that Bellomo developed a close relationship with Santora, who recognized his potential and took him under his wing. As the years went by, Bellomo's influence within the Genovese crime family continued to grow. In 1990, when then-boss Vincent Chin Gigante faced legal troubles, he handpicked Bellomo to become the acting boss of the family. This was a significant honor and responsibility, as Bellomo now had to navigate the treacherous world of organized crime while dealing with increased scrutiny from law enforcement. However, Bellomo's newfound position also brought with it a wave of challenges. In 1996, the FBI launched an investigation into the 1991 murder of drug dealer Ralph De Simone, a crime believed to be orchestrated by the Genovese family. Acting on information provided by Turncoat and former Lucchese family acting boss Alphonse Darko, the FBI set their sights on Bellomo, alleging that he had authorized the hit. The FBI's relentless pursuit of Bellomo led to a series of intense interrogations. He was subjected to multiple lie detector tests, where he vehemently denied any involvement in the murder. To further their case, federal agents even visited Bellomo in prison prison, shaving his head and collecting hair samples in search of a psychoactive drug called lithium, which was rumored to help deceive lie detector tests. However, the drug tests came back negative, and the murder charges against Bellomo eventually crumbled. Despite evading murder charges, Bellomo's legal battles were far from over. In a plea deal, he and numerous other Genovese, gangsters were charged with labor racketeering, bookmaking, and the longtime extortion of vendors at the San Genaro Festival. In 1997, Bellomo accepted the deal and was sentenced to 10 years years in prison. He also had to forfeit a substantial amount of his ill-gotten gains. While serving his sentence, Bellomo faced yet another indictment in July 2001. This time, he was accused of money laundering, specifically embezzling funds from the pension funds of dock workers in the International Longshoremen's Association (ILA). The allegations claimed that Bellomo had laundered the stolen union funds with the help of Thomas Cafaro, the son of Vincent Fish Cafaro, a Genovese soldier who had cooperated with authorities in the past. Thomas Cafaro, torn between loyalty to to his father and the mafia, chose to stand by his mob family and refused to cooperate with the authorities. This decision further solidified the complex web of loyalties within the Genovese crime family. In 2003, Bellomo pleaded guilty to labor racketeering charges related to the New York and New Jersey docks, adding four more years to his sentence. It was a significant blow, but Bellomo remained resilient. By the end of 2008, he was finally released from prison, ready to reclaim his place in the ever-changing landscape of organized crime. As Bellomo Bellomo stepped back onto the streets, he found himself in a new underworld. The once impenetrable walls of the Mafia were crumbling, with informants lurking around every corner and bosses turning on their underlings. The FBI and NYPD were shifting their focus to terrorism and violent gangs, downsizing their teams dedicated to organized crime. But Bellomo was undeterred. He had been groomed by the legendary Vincent Gigante, the last of the old-school bosses. He possessed the credentials, the know-how, the reputation, and most importantly, he had paid his dues. Now, anonymous sources in law enforcement reveal that Liborio Bellomo has emerged as the new official boss of the Genovese crime family. According to these sources, Bellomo operates through Capo Peter P.D. Red Di Chiara, who acts as a middleman or street boss between Bellomo and the family captains. This arrangement mirrors the dynamic between Chin Gigante and Fat Tony Salerno, showcasing the influence and power that Bellomo wields within the organization. But that's not all. Rumors abound about Bellomo's substantial rental income from new numerous apartment buildings in the Bronx and northern suburbs. These properties, worth millions of dollars, serve as a constant source of revenue for the crime boss. Additionally, Bellamo has financial interests in construction companies, which he utilizes to refurbish rundown apartment buildings he acquires. Despite these allegations, concrete evidence of Bellamo's wrongdoing remains elusive, and he remains the Genovese family boss, Vittorio Amuso. Vittorio Amuso, the infamous mobster known as the Deadly Don, and his reign of terror over the Lucchese crime family have left an indelible mark on the criminal underworld. Born in Canarsie, Brooklyn, Amuso grew up surrounded by powerful Italian mobsters, setting the stage for his rise to power. From his involvement in the 19th Hole crew to his partnership with Anthony Gaspipe Casso, Amuso's criminal exploits knew no bounds. With a reputation for violence and an uncanny ability to generate massive profits for the mob, Amuso ascended the ranks, eventually becoming the 
boss of the Lucchese family. His rule was marked by a relentless pursuit of power, resulting in a wave of bloodshed and defections within the organization. Despite serving a life sentence at the Federal Correctional Complex in North Carolina, Amuso's influence over the Lucchese crime family remains, a testament to his chilling legacy. Vittorio Amuso was born on November 4, 1934, in New York City. Growing up in the tough neighborhood of Canarsie, Brooklyn, he found himself surrounded by powerful Italian mobsters who held sway over the streets. It was during this formative period that Amuso became enamored with the allure of organized crime and the power it wielded. As a teenager, Amuso sought to impress the mafia and gain their respect. He began involving himself in petty crimes, eager to prove his worth to the notorious underworld. The mafia, always on the lookout for young talent, took notice of Amuso's potential and nurtured his criminal talents. Amuso's first significant foray into the world of organized crime came when he joined the 19th Hole Crew, a crew run by Christopher Christie Tick Fernari, a capo in the Lucchese crime family. It was within this crew that Amuso met Anthony Gaspep Casso, a partnership that would shape the course of their criminal careers. Amuso and Casso quickly formed a natural alliance, becoming a formidable duo in the criminal underworld. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, they engaged in a wide range of criminal activities, including fraud, extortion, gambling, and drug trafficking. Their criminal empire expanded rapidly, amassing substantial wealth and power. In 1977, Amuso and Casso found themselves embroiled in a heroin bust that involved the Sicilian Mafia and a pipeline from Thailand to the United States. This high-profile case brought them even further into the spotlight, solidifying their reputation as formidable players in the criminal underworld. Not content with their already impressive criminal endeavors, Amuso and Casso were also part of a highly skilled burglary crew known as the Bypass Gang. This crew specialized in meticulously planned and executed heists, targeting banks and jewelry stores in Manhattan and Long Island. Their operations were carried out with such precision that they managed to make off with over $100 million in stolen merchandise. Amuso's ability to generate substantial profits for the mob did not go unnoticed. However, in order to truly establish himself as a force within the mafia, he had to prove his loyalty and commitment. This meant making his bones, as they say in the underworld, by committing murder on behalf of the organization. Whenever Fernari needed someone eliminated, he would call upon Amuso, Casso, or both. Their victims would meet a swift and brutal end, leaving no room for mercy or second chances. Amuso's reputation for violence and his willingness to carry out the most heinous acts propelled him up the ranks of the Lucchese crime family. With each successful hit, Amuso and Casso solidified their positions within the organization. Casso became Fernari's right-hand man, serving as the family's consigliere, while Amuso was promoted to capo of Fernari's old crew. This promotion was a significant step up the ladder, but little did they know that even greater heights awaited them. In 1986, Lucchese crime family boss Antonio Tony Dux Corallo summoned Amuso and Casso to a meeting that would change the course of their lives. Corallo, along with his underboss Tom Mix Santoro and Consigliere Fernari, was facing a life sentence after being found guilty in the commission case. With his eyes on the future of the family, Corallo saw in Amuso and Casso the potential to lead the Lucchese crime family into a new era. The details of the meeting remain shrouded in secrecy, but the outcome was clear. Vittorio Amuso emerged as the new leader of the Lucchese crime family, with Casso serving as his trusted underboss and consigliere at various times. During their reign, the power and influence they now wielded were unparalleled, and they wasted no time in asserting their dominance. Once at the pinnacle of their power atop Mount Olympus, Amuso and Casso unleashed a reign of terror that sent shockwaves through the criminal underworld. Anyone they deemed a threat to their power was swiftly eliminated. Rumors of stealing from the organization were met with deadly consequences. Even the slightest suspicion of potential betrayal was enough to seal one's fate. Amuso's rule was marked by pure terror, causing many soldiers and captains within the Lucchese crime family to defect and become government witnesses. While some have suggested that Casso was the driving force behind the murderous decisions, there is ample evidence to suggest that Amuso was equally involved in the bloodshed. He relished the power and control that came with being the boss, making life and death decisions that shaped the fate of those around him. In his eyes, these were the Cosa Nostra things, the important matters that defined the hierarchy of power within the mafia. However, the mounting body count and the growing number of Lucchese turncoats drew the attention of law enforcement. The bodies left in their wake and the revelations from defectors exposed the family's illicit business dealings, leading to a series of indictments in 1991. Amuso and Casso, tipped off by 
corrupt law enforcement sources, went on the run, seeking refuge and waiting for the storm to pass. Despite their fugitive status, they maintained a firm grip on the Lucchese crime family, frequently visiting associates in New York and setting up a prearranged telephone system using anonymous payphones to communicate with their underlings. However, their freedom was short-lived. In the summer of 1991, as Amuso made his way to a public payphone in a Scranton shopping mall, he was closely monitored by FBI agents. The moment he picked up the phone and dialed, they swiftly apprehended him, placing him in handcuffs. The long arm of the law had finally caught up with the deadly Don. By January 1993, Amuso found himself facing life imprisonment after being found guilty of the racketeering charges he had fled from. Despite his incarceration, he remains the official boss of the Lucchese crime family, commanding respect and reverence from within the organization. Matthew Madonna Born on November 2, 1935, Matthew Madonna's journey into a life of crime began in the most unlikely of places, the Greenhaven Correctional Facility in upstate New York. It was within the cold, unforgiving walls of this prison that Madonna's path would intersect with that of a young drug dealer named Nicky Barnes. Little did they know that this chance encounter would set in motion a chain of events that would forever change their lives. After their release from prison, Madonna and Barnes wasted no time in capitalizing on their newfound partnership. Madonna, with his connection and Barnes, with his street smarts, formed a formidable duo that would soon dominate the narcotics trade. Madonna's role was simple yet crucial. He would discreetly drop off a car loaded with heroin at a Manhattan parking lot, while Barnes would later retrieve the vehicle and exchange the drugs for a substantial amount of cash. This operation became the backbone of their drug empire, supplying large quantities of heroin to the streets. But as the saying goes, the higher you climb, the harder you fall. In 1975, the long arm of the law finally caught up with Matthew Madonna. He was a arrested on charges of drug trafficking, a crime that carried severe consequences. The once mighty drug empire came crashing down, and Madonna's future looked bleak. In a swift and decisive blow, he was sentenced to a staggering 30 years in federal prison, effectively ending his reign as a drug lord. The fall from power was a harsh reality for Matthew Madonna, but little did he know that this would not be the end of his story. After serving two decades behind bars, Madonna would rise once again, this time within the ranks of the notorious Lucchese crime family. After serving two Two decades behind bars, Matthew Madonna emerged from the shadows of the prison system, ready to reclaim his place in the criminal hierarchy. In 1995, Madonna was released and welcomed back into the notorious Lucchese crime family with open arms. Madonna's reputation preceded him, and his past exploits in the drug trade only added to his mystique. He quickly ascended through the ranks, earning the respect and trust of his fellow mobsters. Madonna's rise to power was swift and calculated. He became a capo or captain within the Lucchese crime family, overseeing various criminal enterprises and expanding their illicit operations, but Madonna's ambitions knew no bounds. As he climbed higher within the organization, he set his sights on the ultimate position of power, the role of the acting boss. In 2009, Madonna's dreams became a reality as he assumed the position of acting boss of the Lucchese crime family. With this newfound authority, he wielded immense control over the organization's activities, orchestrating a web of criminal enterprises that spanned across multiple industries. Under Madonna's his leadership, the Lucchese crime family engaged in a wide range of illegal activities, from illegal gambling operations that raked in millions to loan sharking schemes that preyed on the vulnerable. Madonna's empire grew stronger with each passing day, but it wasn't just about money and power for Madonna. He was known for his ruthless nature and willingness to resort to violence to maintain control. His reputation as a fearsome and dangerous mobster sent shivers down the spines of those who dared to cross him. However, Madonna's reign as the acting boss would soon come to an end as the law enforcement agencies closed in on the criminal empire he had built. Law enforcement agencies were relentless in their pursuit of justice. In 2007, Madonna found himself at the center of a year-long investigation, leading to his arrest and subsequent release on bail pending trial. Madonna's time as the acting boss was short-lived. In 2015, he pleaded guilty to a racketeering indictment, resulting in a five-year prison sentence. However, before his release, new charges were brought against him, including the chilling accusation of ordering the murder of Michael Meldish, a prominent figure in the East Harlem Purple Gang. The trial that followed was a spectacle, captivating the public with its shocking revelations and the ultimate verdict. In 2019, Madonna, along with others, was convicted of the murder and sentenced to life in prison in 2020. Today, Matthew Madonna resides in the United States Penitentiary in Kentucky, serving his life sentence. Madonna stepped aside from acting boss in 2017 in a bloodless coup, which saw Michael DeSantis take over as acting boss. Michael DeSantis. Yes.
In the treacherous world of organized crime, one name stands out, Michael DeSantis. This notorious mobster, known for his efficiency and loyalty, rose to power as the acting boss of the Lucchese crime family, one of New York's five families. His journey to the top of the criminal underworld is a tale of bloodshed, betrayal, and a shocking coup orchestrated from behind prison walls. But his ascent to leadership was no ordinary feat. It was orchestrated through a coded letter sent from prison by the uh, imprisoned for life mafia boss, Vittorio Vicamuso. Michael DeSantis, born on October 1, 1953 in Brooklyn, New York City, was destined for a life of crime. As a longtime member of the Lucchese crime family's Brooklyn faction, DeSantis quickly made a name for himself as an efficient and loyal hitman and moneymaker. Before his criminal exploits, DeSantis owned an auto body shop in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn, but it was his personal friendship with Lucchese boss Victor Amuso that led him down a dark path, forever entwining his fate with the notorious crime family. DeSantis's involvement in the Lucchese family began with a heinous act. In December 1988, he participated in the murder of Angelo Sigona, a Brooklyn counterfeiter. Sigona had crossed paths with Lucchese family consigliere Anthony Casso's neighbor, mistreating his daughter and sparking a deadly chain of events. DeSantis, alongside his partner Richard Pagliarulo, lured Sigona to his demise. On that fateful day, Sigona's life was abruptly cut short, his body discovered in a parked car with a single gunshot wound to the back of his head. This ruthless act solidified DeSantis's reputation within the Lucchese family. His loyalty and willingness to carry out orders earned him the trust of his superiors, paving the way for his rise through the ranks. But DeSantis's criminal activities extended far beyond murder. He was heavily involved in cocaine trafficking, orchestrating a network that smuggled hundreds of pounds of Colombian cocaine into the United States. In July 1991, the U.S. Coast Guard intercepted a boat off the coast of Long Island, carrying a staggering $800 million worth of Colombian cocaine. This operation was believed to be part of DeSantis's vast network, generating immense profits for the Lucchese family. DeSantis's involvement in the Lucchese family's illicit activities made him a force to be reckoned with. His reputation as a hitman and moneymaker grew, solidifying his position within the criminal underworld. But little did he know that his journey was just beginning. The events that unfolded would shape the course of his life and the fate of the Lucchese crime family forever. In September 1991, the Lucchese crime family was embroiled in internal turmoil. Acting boss Alphonse Darko had become a target, and DeSantis played a key role in a plot to eliminate him. DeSantis planted a gun in a bathroom at the Kimberly Hotel in Manhattan, intending for another family. Remember to carry out the hit. However, Darko, already suspicious of his own impending demise, managed to escape the assassination attempt. Darko's narrow escape led him to enter the witness security program, where he would later become a crucial government witness testifying against Amuso and other mafia bosses. DeSantis's luck would soon run out. In April 1993, he and several other Lucchese family members were indicted for racketeering and the murders of Angelo Sigona and John Morrissey. The law had finally caught up with him. In October 1994, DeSantis was sentenced to 21 years in prison for his crimes. He would spend the next 16 years behind bars, separated from the power and influence he once wielded within the Lucchese family. During his time in prison, DeSantis maintained contact with Lucchese boss Victor Amuso, who was serving a life sentence. Their connection would prove crucial in the years to come. But as DeSantis languished behind bars, the Lucchese crime family underwent significant changes. Bronx-based acting boss Matthew Madonna faced indictment, and the Brooklyn faction saw an opportunity to regain power. They wrote a letter to Amuso, recommending DeSantis as the new leader to bring the base of power back to Brooklyn. Amuso approved the recommendation, and DeSantis was appointed as the acting boss of the Lucchese crime family family. If Madonna didn't step aside, Amuso had a hit list that included a captain and several members of the family. DeSantis is currently the acting boss of the Lucchese family, John Angelo Gotti. Born on February 14, 1964 in Queens, New York City, Gotti Jr. followed in the footsteps of his infamous father, John Gotti, and joined the Mafia in 1988. By the time he was 26, he had already become the youngest capo in Gambino family history, solidifying his position as a rising star in the criminal underworld. From his induction into the Gambino crime family to his decision to walk away from it all, Gotti Jr.'s life was a whirlwind of power, violence, and shocking revelations. Growing up in Howard Beach, New York, he had a 
a childhood that was far from ordinary. While most kids were playing in the streets, Gotti Jr. was exposed to a world of crime and secrecy. His father, John Gotti, was already entangled in a life of organized crime, with a reputation that preceded him. Although Gotti Jr. didn't see his father much during his formative years, the glimpses he did catch left an indelible mark on his young mind. As Gotti Jr. approached adulthood, he found himself on the precipice of a decision that would shape the course of his life. The infamous John Gotti had become the leader of the Gambino crime family, executing a plan to eliminate the current boss, Paul Castellano, in 1985. With his father's power solidified, Gotti Jr. became a rising star in the New York underworld. In 1988, at the age of 24, Gotti Jr. officially joined the ranks of the Gambino crime family. His induction marked the beginning of a new chapter, one that would see him rise through the ranks and become the youngest capo in Gambino family history by the time he was 26. The bond between father and son grew stronger as Gotti Jr. embraced the lifestyle that his father had so fiercely embodied. When Gotti Sr. embraced his son, looking at him as a street-savvy individual, it was a moment of immense pride for Gotti Jr. He was slowly becoming like his father, a realization that both thrilled and terrified him. But as we will soon discover, the life of crime that Gotti Jr. had embraced would eventually lead him down a path of self-reflection and a decision that would forever change the course of his life. After his father John Gotti was convicted of racketeering and murder charges in 1992, Gotti Jr. found himself thrust into the role of acting boss of the Gambino crime family. As an immediate family member, he was allowed to visit his father in prison, becoming the conduit through which his father's messages and orders were relayed to his criminal associates on the outside. Gotti Jr. embraced his newfound position of power, taking charge of the family's operations. He adopted a more secretive approach to doing business, attempting to present himself as a legitimate businessman. However, he soon discovered that he lacked the negotiation skills and finesse of his father, often finding himself on the losing end of disputes with rival families. During this time, Gotti Jr. faced numerous challenges as he navigated the treacherous world of organized crime. The name John Gotti still carried weight and notoriety, and Gotti Jr. had to prove himself worthy of his father's legacy. He was constantly under scrutiny from law enforcement agencies who were determined to bring down the Gambino crime family. But as the years went by, Gotti Jr. began to question the path he had chosen. The toll of living a life of constant danger and deception weighed heavily on him. He witnessed the devastating consequences of the mob lifestyle, both within his own family and in the wider criminal world. In a pivotal moment, Gotti Jr. realized that he had to make a choice. He had seen firsthand the sacrifices his father had made, the toll it took on his family, and the inevitable fate that awaited those involved in organized crime. He knew that, as his father had once said, at the end of the day, you gotta die or go to jail. In 1998, federal authorities dealt a significant blow to Gotti Jr.'s criminal empire. He was indicted on a broad range of charges, including loan sharking, bookmaking, and extortion. Faced with overwhelming evidence, Gotti Jr. made a decision that would change the course of his life. He accepted a plea deal in 1999, pleading guilty to four acts of racketeering. The consequences of his decision were significant. Gotti Jr. was sentenced to six years and five months in prison and fined $1 million. Just before beginning his sentence, he had a final meeting with his father who tried to convince him to fight the charges and remain a proud member of the mob. It was a poignant moment, the last time father and son would ever see each other. John Goody, aware of the relentless pursuit of the government, warned his son that they would never leave him alone. He cautioned Gotti Jr. that pleading guilty would not be the end, as the government would continue to bring more cases against him. Despite his father's wishes, Gotti Jr. chose to accept the plea deal, embarking on a decade-long process of extricating himself from the criminal life he had been born into. In June 2002, while Gotti Jr. was serving his prison sentence, his father, John Gotti, passed away from throat cancer. The loss of his father, the man who had been both a mentor and a source of inspiration, further fueled Gotti Jr.'s determination to leave the criminal underworld behind. Throughout his time in prison, Gotti Jr. reflected on the choices he had made and the consequences they had brought upon him and his family. He began to question the values and principles that had governed his life for so long. The desire for a different future, one free from the constant threat of violence and incarceration, grew stronger within him. After serving his time, Gotti Jr. faced a new challenge, rebuilding his life outside of the criminal world. He distanced himself from the Gambino family, maintaining that he had left it behind. However, rumors and speculation persisted, with some claiming that he had become an informant, cooperating with law enforcement. Gotti Jr. vehemently denied these claims, asserting that he had chosen a different path for himself and his family. He married Kimberly Albanese, and together they have six children. Gotti Jr. sought to create a new legacy, 
one that was far removed from the dark shadow of his father's criminal empire. In 2015, Gotti Jr. authored a book titled Shadow of My Father, in which he shared his experiences and reflections on his life in the mob. The book provided a glimpse into the inner workings of organized crime and the personal struggles he faced as he sought to break free from its grip. If you enjoyed this video, click on one of the boxes playing on your screen for more content.